Welcome everyone to uh, the next in our fluorescence microscopy webinar series on multi-photon imaging. Thanks Kevin for the introduction um, and thanks to the organizers of Bruker for, for putting this together and for inviting me to give a talk. I'm really looking forward to sharing a bit about my work and sort of how we think about probing neural circuits uh, using optical methods in the Clendidin lab um, and the kinds of questions we can answer uh, with those methods. So um, I'm a neurobiologist and I'm really interested in understanding how the brain um, processes visual information to guide behavior. So especially under the conditions that characterize naturalistic vision. So that's, I'll fill that in what I mean by that a little bit more, but basically that is to say vision in the real world. And today I'm gonna to tell you about um, some of my work studying parts of the brain that underlie visually guided behaviors. And I'll talk a bit about the optical methods that we use and that we're developing in the lab to allow us to ask new questions and to get really new insights into the visual system that we couldn't um, before. So um, to motivate what I'll talk about today, sort of scientifically, I'll show a little, um, I want you to think about sort of a, a visual neuroscience task that's maybe typical of standard ex experiments in, in a visual neuroscience lab. So imagine that you're an animal or maybe a visual neuron that's responsible for uh, encoding a small feature of interest like this small dot moving across the screen there. And it's a relatively easy task. It's pretty high signal to noise ratio. There's not many other salient features present, but as you might imagine, natural vision is a lot more complicated than this, right? And that's for at least a couple of reasons. The first is that the heterogeneous structure of the natural world means that visual neurons have to detect small features of interest across highly variable visual context. So if you give some natural background to this same task, it becomes a little more difficult, right? The real world has a lot of structure and that structure can be pretty unpredictable. That makes the task more challenging. The second thing that makes this difficult is that the visual environment is almost constantly changing due to the animal's own movements of their eyes, head, or body throughout the world, right? They're actively sampling the world. They're not just passively receiving information from the visual environment. So imagine now the animal is turning through, through an environment trying to perform the same task. It becomes even harder still. So what I'll talk about here on the science side is how the visual system reliably extracts information about small local features like that uh, in the context of really variable natural scenes that might include really strong self-motion signals. So um, I study this question in uh, Drosophila, the fruit fly. Um, this is a really great system to study visual neuroscience uh, because they do, these flies do perform really complex visual behaviors with something like uh, one or 200,000 neurons. Uh, for example, here's a video from uh, Michael Dickinson's lab showing a, a collection of fruit flies running around this, this chamber. And you can see this green fly, which is a male, identifies this now labeled pink fly, which is a female, and uses this visual information to identify that that's a potential mate and then track her through this really complex environment. So they can use their visual systems to do really complicated things in context when there's lots of motion from themselves and from other things out in the, in the world, right? Uh, flies are also great because they have stereotyped um, identifiable neurotypes with really great genetic access. So we have excellent genetic tools to, to probe these neurons. Um, and as I'll talk about today, it's a pretty small brain. So we have the ability to image across entire neur neural populations during behavior. And we'll talk about, about, about that as well. Um, okay. Um, so a little bit of introduction to the Drosophila visual system, if you're not familiar, and many of you probably aren't. Um, visual information first uh, enters the retina and the eye uh, here, labeled in pink. Uh, from there, uh, information travels to two neural pills called the lamina and the medulla. Uh, in these regions, so this is the green and blue regions here and the, uh, maybe you can see my pointer in the, um, in the schematic. And it's here where you start to see things like luminous and contrast adaptation. You see uh, neuronal receptive fields with spatial and temporal bandpass filtering. So these are kind of like retinal ganglion cells in vertebrate visual system, for example. From there, information goes to the lobular plate. Um, this brown neuropil here in the optic lobe. This is where features like direction selectivity and orientation selectivity first appear. And then uh, from here, uh, there's also a, a neuropil in the optic lobe called the lobula. And this is a really, this is gonna be kind of the focus of my talk today. This is where uh, we think of things like visual feature detection happening. So neurons here are responsible for things like uh, visual loom and small moving objects, like that small dot that I showed you in the beginning, sort of cartoonified uh, video. And a particular importance to this talk, uh, there's a collection of neurons um, that live in the 
in the lobula called visual projection neurons or VPNs, which project from the lobula of the optic lobe to these um, small structures in the central brain called optic glomeruli, right? And it's these VPNs that are thought to underlie feature detection, uh, local feature detection in flies, and they sit at this really critical bottleneck in the visual hierarchy, right? They carry, they carry pretty highly processed visual information from optic lobes to the central brain where that information is then used to guide behavior uh, like object tracking and, and avoidance. So they're really sit at a key place in the circuit uh, to guide visual behaviors. And what do these cells look like? Uh, if, you took, if you look at just one of these types of VPNs called LC11, for example, uh, here I'm expressing GFP in a population of LC11 um, neurons, and uh, in, which is shown in green. And you can see the axons, which are projecting into the optic glomerulus of the central brain, and the dendrites, which live out in the, in the optic uh, lobes. Um, so the part of the central brain where all the axons of these LC11 neurons co and project into is called, the L is called the optic glomerulus for that LC11. So it's private to this type of VPN. And schematize it looks something like this, where something, in this case, like 40 to 100 individual neurons all converge together onto this cognate optical glomerulus for LC11 in the central brain. And it'll become obvious why I'm, why I'm telling you all this um, in a little bit. But this is sort of the, the organization of this system you should think about. So how do we study this question using optical methods? How do we image these populations to get some sense of their visual responses? Um, I'll show a bit about the, the setup that we use. So we use a Bruker resonant scanning scope with the piezo-driven uh, objective. So we can collect fast, relatively fast volume scans. Uh, this is an image of this, um, the rig that was used for all these experiments. So you can see we've crammed a lot of stuff underneath uh, the objective here, including uh, two DLP visual projectors shown here, which project an image onto this screen in front of the fly, which of course is gonna be sitting underneath this objective. You can't see the fly. We have two IR cameras for behavior tracking. The animal is walking on an air suspended treadmill, which allows us to measure its intended walking movements. And then we've tied this all together with custom visual simulation software that we use for open or closed loop visual display. So the animal's own movements can update uh, the visual stimulus presented to the animal um, in sort of virtual reality like um, uh, perception for, for the animal. So this allows us to image activity in specific parts of the brain or even the whole brain while the animal is being presented with controlled visual stimuli and while we're measuring the animal's behavioral responses as well. All right, so the flies are really a, a great system to study these kinds of questions. As you can see, uh, we can do a lot in, in a single experiment. Okay, um, so what do these visual responses look like in these VPNs? Uh, I'm gonna show you some really simple experiments to get you acquainted with these, these cells a bit.